Hello, Scaling Up Nation, and welcome to the special holiday edition of the Industrial Water Week celebration that Scaling Up H2O is doing. And of course, today, October 10th, it is Waste Water Thursday. Folks, I know a lot of us out there are doing wastewater, and we have a lot of questions around wastewater. However, I had one particular question that founder James McDonald asked, and I'm gonna be playing that in a second, and then wastewater expert Kevin Cope is joining us to answer that question. Folks, I'm curious, what are you doing to spread the word about Industrial Water Week? It's the first time ever that we have had a holiday just for us water treaters. Thank you, James McDonald, for doing that. But now it's up to us to actually do something with that. I've got customers that are wishing me happy Industrial Water Week because I've been talking about it so much. How cool is that? And you're thinking, oh my gosh, Trace, what are you talking to these customers about? But you know, one of my jobs is to make sure that people know about the industrial water treatment industry. That's my job as a podcast host. That is my job as a water treatment company owner. So I hope you're doing your part as well. And another fun fact, it's actually my anniversary today. I have been married to Stacy Blackmore for 21 years. Folks, I got to tell you, a lot of people lost that bet. They never saw it going more than a year. We brought it out to 21 years. And Stacy, I know we're going to have 21 more. So thank you for 21 wonderful years and happy anniversary. Folks, let's get right to our guest. So join me as I bring in Kevin Cope. Well, Scaling Up Nation, in the true spirit of Industrial Water Week and celebrating the holiday, I'm not answering all these questions. Of course, I'm bringing in experts that know exactly what these questions are asking for so you, the nation, can learn what you need to know from these listener questions. And today, I am joined by Kevin Cope of Brintag North America. How are you, Kevin? Never better, Trace. Never better. Well, Kevin, I know you're a listener of the show, and uh, I truly want to thank you for that. And I want to thank you for coming on this special holiday edition and talking a little bit about wastewater. My, my pleasure. My pleasure. I've been looking forward to this since, uh, since you invited me. Well, let me ask you, what are you doing to celebrate Industrial Water Week? Well, I'm actually attending the uh, Pittsburgh Chemical Day. I'm, I live in Pittsburgh. And I'm going down. Our president is actually speaking at Pittsburgh Chemical Week or Chemical Day. I've gone down off and on for a few years, so I'm, I'm going to be attending that. Look, very much looking forward to that. Well, awesome. Well, let's go ahead and get right into it. We have a question from a listener. It's James McDonald, of course, the founder of Industrial Water Week. So let's go ahead and see what he has to ask, and we'll see if we can answer it. All right, let's go. Happy Wastewater Thursday of Industrial Water Week. My question for today is what are some tips to ensure a jar study mimics system conditions as closely as possible? Well, James, thanks so much for your question. And of course, we're joined by Kevin Cope, wastewater expert. So Kevin, what do you think? Well, first, it was a great question from Jim. Um, you know, he's, uh, James is a, is a great guy, well-respected in the AWT. So a little bit of pressure to make sure I get this answer correct. So um, you know, I, I thought about this question, and, and one of the things that, that I wanted to start out with was really kind of getting a background on a jar test. I mean, one of the things that we've seen over the years is we always make a joke, don't run a jar test just to run a jar test. So really, before you start, you really need to determine the purpose of your jar test. What am I trying to do? Again, don't jar test this to jar test. We always like Kevin. Do you mind if I ask the question? If for the listener today that's just getting into wastewater or just knows what the term is, what is a jar test? Well, a jar test is where you take and you have a piece of equipment uh, that actually has stirs, and most of us are familiar with called what's called the ANF uh, machine jar stir, where there are four locations, and they are stirs, and they look very much like paint stirs, and you can vary the speed, and as these rotate. You put your water in there, your wastewater in there, and then you add your chemicals accordingly, and you observe what the flock looks like, what the coagulant looks like, what settling looks like, what rise looks like. There are a variety of different brands of these jar stirs, 
But for the most part, people always think of this ANF4 uh, gang star, four position stirs. And usually you get clear glass uh, jars or square jars. And you just observe, you put the appropriate dosage in, and you observe what the flocculation or coagulation looks like. And they're a great tool for the wastewater group. People in wastewater, they really make a nice demonstration on what is exactly happening in the system. Kevin, I don't know if I've told anybody this before, but of course, everybody knows my father introduced me into this business. And I remember being with him when I was younger and he had his gang stirrer out and we were running some tests. Of course, I was watching. He was running the test. But for years, I thought it was called the gangster. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, never heard that. But I have heard them called gangsters. I mean, but I've never thought of it as a gangster. Just never thought of that until now. It's kind of funny. You know, it makes sense, though, but I mean, people do call them gangsters, jar stirs. Um, you know, my kids have seen me run jar tests since they were born. So, um, you know, they, my kids are well aware of what these things are. And, and they really are a staple within the wastewater industry. You know, everybody has one. I have one in my garage and I get out periodically. They do a great job of demonstrating and really seeing what you're getting when you're doing coagulation, flocculation, or precipitation. Great, great piece of equipment. So now that we know what a jar stirrer or a gang stirrer, or in my case, a gangster is, <laughs> how do we make sure that we're using it properly? How do we make sure we're mimicking the system? But then as you were going in, how do we know we even need to use it? Or when's the best time to use it? One of the things I always do when we do our wastewater training class is one of the questions I always ask first in jar testing is, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to remove zinc? Are you trying to remove oil? Are you looking for better settling? Are you looking for an easier program? Are you trying to reduce costs? Those are some of the key, and many others, but those are some of the key questions that you really do need to establish before you run your jar test. Um, you know, one of the things I always say is, we can add inorganic polymers till we're blue in the face, and we're not going to precipitate zinc with an inorganic polymer. So you really need to ask the customer, what am I trying to remove? What are my problems? And those are really issues that are really key to setting up a correct jar test, and as James has asked, to mimic what's going on. So those are really keys. Well, you know, once you have that established, you know what you're trying to do. One of the things I like to do is, you know, walk the system or tour the system. See what it looks like. Do a line diagram. I'm great for drawing line diagrams and things along this line. You know, ask for swings in the application. You know, do they clean on the weekends, so therefore Mondays are always bad? Do they run 24 hours a day? What are the contaminants? What are the degree of contaminants? Does it vary greatly or does it vary little? You know, look for where the products are being fed, where their current programs are being fed. How are they being fed? Are they being diluted? Are they neat? Is it a batch or continuous operation? You know, and the key here, Trace, to me is when I'm walking the system, I always, always, always look for points that I can take samples and look at the water. And we'll get into that later, but that's really a key point for me is any system that I walk through, I always look for if they're adding the coagulant, is there somewhere after the coagulant's added that I can get a sample? And th that's really a key for me when I'm walking through a system. And then, you know, you look at what, what are the products that they're being used and understand the function. I started in this industry. This is my 40th year in wastewater treatment. And well, congratulations. Started, that's amazing. Uh, thank you. <laughs> a lot of people thought I wouldn't make it past six months. But, but I've, it's 40, 40 years in, in water treat, wastewater treatment. And when I started, I started with a company called Triolite. And it's interesting that Triolite started out, they said, flocculation, coagulation. Well, coagulation is the actual creation of a pin flock. Flocculation is the bridging of those pin flocks. But Triolite referred to the flocculation as being the creation of pin flock and coagulation of being pulling the flocks together. And, you know, so to me, it's always understand the functionality of what you're trying to do yeah, you, you need to have the correct terms. But again, if I still was a triolite, it would have been flocculation followed by coagulation. But now, you know, within our industry, it's coagulation followed by flocculation. Coagulation being charge neutralization or creating pin flock. And then flocculation, bridging the particles, making them larger. And that's what's considered flocculation. 
Kevin, let me ask. There's so many terms out there in the water treatment industry, and now we're talking about wastewater terms. Is there a specific resource that you like to recommend people to go to to find out exactly what these terms are and to study more? Well, there is a there is a manual through the AWT that we're actually trying to maybe to rewrite. But for the most part, a lot of the terms are there. Um, I was I was helped. Uh, Rich Desson was actually the author, among other people, putting this together. And um, there are terms and discussions in there on what these terms are. Again, I'm more into the understanding of functionality. You neutralize charge first, coagulation, and then you bridge the flock second, flocculation. But again, there is a manual through the AWT, and Heidi or or, um, or Angela uh, could help you uh, get that manual. And there would be terms in there. From other things, you know, obviously over 40 years, I've amassed a fairly large library of technical information and things along this line. You know, I will make another comment, uh, Trace. The biggest change for me has been the internet. I, I use the internet a lot, especially when we're looking at precipitating something that's kind of unusual. And I'll just Google it. That's the, to me, it's one of the, been the, one of the biggest changes since when I started. Uh, we used to have this little book called the Cherry Book that we would constantly be looking through. How do you take out zinc? What's the pH for nickel? But now, I mean, for me, I go online and just say pH of nickel when I find out what it is. So that's to me, is where I, I use the, the Internet a lot. Just to give me an idea of, of, of terms and how to, how to uh, remove certain things from water. Great advice. Well, that all said, now it's ready to jar test. So one of the things that I like to uh, recommend to folks is this is from my old Calgon days. Take the samples yourself. If you go out, you take the sample. You know what you're getting. You're looking and you want to make sure you don't have any polymer already in it. You want to make sure that you're getting it from the correct spot. Um, I always ask the operator, does this look normal? Um, that's just a little question I've always asked the operator. Does this look normal? And if they say yes, then I feel pretty comfortable. It's not 100% guaranteed. But, you know, if they say, oh, you know, it looks a little crazy today, you know, you might want to start asking why was something done, things along this line. So I take the sample myself. And again, I've already looked at all the different potential sample points. And I put that sample on my jarster or gangster or gangster, as it were, and just kind of look at it, see what it looks like, get an idea. Oh, another thing that I like to do, if they'll let you, I like to take pictures when I'm pouring the plant. You know, take pictures of the flock size, take pictures of the clarity, look at the settling rate, look at the pin flock. And if they'll let you take pictures, they're a great resource. Going back and looking, this is what it looked like that day. And again, I made the comment, you know, get a representative sample with no treatment. And then these are, these are little keys that we always like to put out in the wastewater training class. If you're going to do testing a coagulant, you know, the, the charge neutralization, the pretreatment must have already been completed. In other words, you're precipitating zinc. The zinc must be already precipitated before you run a coagulant. If you're looking at a flocculant, the coagulation step must be totally complete before you do a flocculant. So think little, little keys in, in the back of your mind to remember. One of the things I like to do when I do a jar test is I like to, if they'll let us, you know, get a sample of the competitive product. And I always like to get two samples. I like to get a sample of the actual made down product right from the plant. But then if they give us a sample of the neat product, make it down to where they perceive the dilution is being made down to. And where I'm going there is oftentimes maybe at the end of the shift, the guy has another hour to go and he's supposed to wait until the last 15 minutes to make down the polymer. And I got to get out of here early. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to make it down now, which then starts to throw off the actual dilution rate if they're doing batch. Or conversely, they forget to do it and they wait and the tank's totally empty. They make it down. So now the batch is a little light. So I like to get the sample out of the dilution tank and test that to see what's going on, but then also make down a known quantity of the product so that I know that what I'm putting in is the exact dosage rate. And then, you know, again, you know, get a, when you're walking through, get a sense on what the program looks like. Try to mimic the plant. The one thing I like to do, Trace, is I like to test for chemistry first, Okay. Um, when I do my initial jar testing, I give very little credence or thought about how much mixing is going on in the plant. I like to look at the chemistry. I like to refine my chemistry. And what I mean by that is, you know, if the chemistry doesn't work, you can have the greatest mixing in the plant. It isn't going to work. 
So I typically, you know, focus in on, uh, on uh, my chemistry. And when I'm looking at that, I do take a look at the mixing, but in at the same time, I really look at the chemistry. And once I feel comfortable with the chemistry, then I start, you know, I look at the plant itself. Um, I look at, at the flock formation. How fast does it form? What are some of the non-chemical related parameters? Is there a long stretch between the mixing areas? All right, so now that we've decided that we like the chemistry that we've jar tested, we feel comfortable with it, we feel that it will meet the needs of the customer, treats the water nicely. One of the things, um, I want, one of the things I like to do then is go out and estimate the mix time. And what I do there, remember I commented about, you know, looking for sample points. I'll now go out and I'll get samples from the actual plant. And I'll put it on my jar stir and I'll look at it. How big is the flock? What does it look like? How quickly does it settle? I may time the settling. It takes 30 seconds to settle. It takes a minute to settle. And now I'll go back and I'll rerun the test with the chemistries that I've decided work. And I'll try to mimic what I'm seeing in the system. Either mimic or do better than what I'm seeing in the system. You know, if, if they're having problems with settling and it takes maybe a minute to settle, I'll start looking at polymers of flocculants that may make it settle more quickly. Can I settle in 30 seconds? Can I settle in 45? And really try to mimic what they're doing, but also improve on that. So it, 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 it really works well. And I've, I'm a big fan of doing that, going out, physically looking at the plant, looking at the system, and sampling those waters, those wastewaters, those treated wastewaters, to see what it looks like. So that's to me is a key, and, and, and James's question is actually, how do I mimic it? Well, the way you mimic it is actually look and see what it's doing. And I, I've, been, I've had a lot of success, especially once we start a trial, to actually take samples out of the plant and say, this is what it was doing before, this is what it's doing now. How do I do that? Why, why did it do Why is it getting better? Things along this line. Let me ask, how long does a typical trial last? Uh, let's let's step back first, if you don't mind. A typical jar test, can, I want to talk about that first, if you don't mind. A jar test, we like to recommend, don't just do it once. Do it a few times. Do it two or three times. And the reason you want to do that is you want to make sure you're getting a representative sample on that specific day. All right? So we want to run a jar test more than once. A lot of times the customer may only give you one time to run a jar test, and you take that. But to answer your question, how long does a typical plant trial take, it can really go anywhere from a week to several months, really depending on the size of the account. Usually it takes a number of days just to get everything in place, make sure your feed pumps are correct, make sure you've cleaned out the previous uh, chemical from the lines. I've seen too many times where, you know, the line is supposedly cleaned and it's not, and now you have a problem with plugage in the lines. So do a real good job of cleaning the system before you start your polymer. But as far as that goes, that really can vary, Trace. I've had ones that have taken a day. I've had ones that have taken several months. So that really depends on really the size of the account. We've looked at the system. We've got an idea how long things may settle by looking at the thing. So now I want to talk about what do I do now? I have an idea what the system is doing. I've got my chemical figured out. Now I want to talk about how I jar test. What, what do I do to mimic the system? So, Kevin, it sounds like at this point in time, we've got our chemistries figured out. Now what? Well, what I like to do is, you know, start again back looking at the non-chemical treatments. How much mixing? How much settling? Again, try to estimate the time. How long does it take to settle? Now, this is going to become a little easier as you run more and more jar tests and you observe more and more plants. You know, I can look at a plant and say, boy, that is really good mixing, or man, that's really poor. I will say, in my experience, we have gotten a lot better in the wastewater industry over the last 40 years, getting better mixing within systems. When I started, I mean, mixing was the last thing people thought about when they put in systems. Nowadays, I, from what I've been seeing, you know, you have the outliers, but for the most part, mixing has become very good within plants. So now that I have my treatment program figured out, and just want to reiterate a very important point, precipitation must occur fully before coagulation starts, and coagulation must occur fully before flocculation starts. 
So one of the things I do when I do my jar test is I will start and, and I will start to refine, let's say, the coagulation dosage. Is it 5, 10, 15, 20? I get a sense on where that best dosage is at. I take a look. I turn the jar stirrer on and off very often, looking at it until I feel very comfortable that the dosage, and let's just for the sake of this discussion, say it's 10 parts per million. What I'll do is I will rerun that test at 5, 10, and maybe 20 or 15 parts per million of that product, mixing what I think correlates to what the plant is doing, and I will look at that, and I will make a determination. 10 is still the best with what I perceive as being the best mixing or adequate mixing or equal mixing to what's in the system. So that, to me, is the key, is once you come up with a dosage, go back and bracket it. Run lower, run the dosage, and run higher to get a good sense that this is what I'm seeing in the system. Obviously, you really want to see it better, but you want to make sure that you're close or better than what they're currently doing. I, I put a little note down here that, you know, back in the old days when we took pictures and we were allowed to take pictures, there was such a major difference between Fuji film and Kodak film, believe it or not. You know, the Fuji pictures always look greener than the Kodak. And the joke always was, oh, you use Fuji film when you took jar test pictures because it made them look better. So, um, but it, For all the millennials listening, you're going to have to explain <laughs> to them what uh, film actually is. <laughs> Good point. Well, they, I'll tell you what, digital, digital photography is wonderful. But I just I, when I was put into thinking about this, I thought, man, I remember those days. You wait a week to get the pictures back and just hope that you took them, took them well. But it was just so funny, the difference between... Kodak and Fuji film. And then another key is, is run side by side. Get the products that they're currently using, be it yours or the competitors, and run them side by side. And look, how close do they mimic what the system looks like? Again, you've, you've taken your samples out of the system, you've looked at them, you get a feel for flock size, and now you sit there and you say, okay, am I close to this? Am I better than this? And those, that really works well when you run side-by-side -side comparisons to look how well your program does compared to what they're currently doing, whether they're using your chemistry and you're trying to improve it or using competitors' chemistry and you're trying to prove that. And then you always want to show the results to the customer, either live or through photography. The, the one thing that wastewater has over boiler cooling is we have the ability to show our results instantaneously to our customers. And that is really one of the things that, that I think sets wastewater apart is we, we have the ability to bring someone down and say, here's what you're doing. Here's what we can do for you. And I think that's really one of the things that, that really sets wastewater uh, jar testing apart. So th those are kind of my thought processes. Uh, key notes here is, is how do you mimic the system? Well, you mimic it by looking at it, getting an idea of what the flock size looks like. If you can take samples out of the plant, Take the samples, look at them, time the settling, potentially time how much mixing you have. But again, the key is get an understanding when you walk through the plant what the flock size looks like, how quickly it settles in the clarifier, how quickly it rises in the DAF. Those are really key. And then try to mimic that in your jar stirs by looking and saying, okay, the flock is this size. And I'm, I put my polymer and my flocculant in and it takes me 30 seconds to get to that. Well, if I go to a minute and a half, the flock gets quite a good bit bigger, but I probably only have 30 seconds of mixing in the plant. So those are kind of the thoughts that I had as far as how to mimic a jar test. It really does come with experience and time, you know, getting an idea. But again, as I said, I do think that uh, we have gotten a lot better in this industry with uh, better mixing for the polymers. Well, Kevin, I got to tell you, 40 years of experience, I'm sure you have this down to a science. And I want to thank you. You took a very simple question and you took us on an entire thought process. And I'm going to put you on the spot right now. Will you come back for a full scaling up episode and we can talk about the complete process of how to do a plant survey and what you do when you get back to your lab? Oh, I would absolutely love to do that. I'd be honored, to be honest, to do it. I, I, I enjoy doing the wastewater training classes for the AWT. I enjoy the new people coming into our industry, you know, thinking, you know, where I was at when I was 23 years old, um, sitting there wide-eyed like, you know, what is a 
what is a gangster? I got to tell you, that is, that is funny. I, I, I'm probably going to use that in the next training class. Yeah, I know. I would absolutely be honored. Well, awesome. Well, I'm going to schedule that with you and we'll get you back on Scaling Up. And I want to thank you for helping the Scaling Up Nation celebrate Industrial Water Week. Well, my pleasure, Trace. I very much thank you. Scale it up, Nation. I got to tell you, one of the coolest things about hosting this podcast is being able to talk to all of the people out there that make industrial water treatment great. We have so much experience where people have started in the industry like Kevin 40 years ago, and he's had 40 years to figure wastewater out. You cannot read that in a book. Of course, there are books out there, and you can get started with that, but there is no substitute for getting out there and asking the questions as you're doing things. I'm going to have Kevin back for an entire wastewater show. We've already scheduled it, so don't worry about that. That's coming up in the future. I know that you are going to love that. And of course, we've got one more day of Industrial Water Week. We're going to be talking about careers. And folks, obviously, you have some sort of affiliation in the water treatment industry because you're listening to this show or you just really like my voice. And I appreciate that. I know there's some people like that out there. I want to make sure that you are spreading the word about how awesome it is to work in this industry. I'll admit, it is not for everybody, and I absolutely love the fact that I'm not tied to a desk every single day, that I can go out to each one of our customers, and none of them are the same. Of course, the relationships we build with the customers, but always learning. Folks, I cannot think of a single day in water treatment that I did not learn something new. If you cannot say that, I don't think you're trying hard enough. And I want you to think about how do you make yourself better? How do you learn new things? And how do you validate that you're doing that? I know you're going to have more fun if you do that on a consistent basis. And I know you're going to have fun with me tomorrow when we're talking about careers in Industrial Water Week on this special holiday edition of Scaling Up H2O. Talk to you tomorrow, folks. 